So the, the talk today is um, peer review on the move from closed to open. Um, and so I work for a, a project called Open Air. Some of you might be um, familiar with Open Air, uh, not least if you were, attended our open peer review workshop yesterday. Uh, uh, today I will, uh, there will be some of the, the same material from, uh, naturally from my talk yesterday. Um, for those of you who were in attendance, I forgive you. No, please forgive me. <laughs> For those who weren't in attendance, I forgive you. <laughs> um, yeah, repetition is good for pedagogy. So, uh, um, today I'm going to tell you what open air is, who I work for, what we do, um, why we are interested in the field of open peer review, and what we've done in the field of open peer review, what we're doing, and what we plan to do in the future. So, uh, Open Air is uh, a European Commission funded project, now, now funded under Horizon 2020, but it was funded twice already under Framework Programme 7. So we've been in existence since 2009, and um, our mission, our, our vision is science set free. So we are everything about uh, implementing, um, um, changing the system of scientific uh, the scientific process from, to move from closed to open. Our uh, open air has progressed very much in line with the progression of the European Commission. Uh, recent announcements from the European uh, Union um, show that Europe really is getting behind open science. They weren't the first to experiment with um, mandating open access, but since uh, but since they started in 2008, they really, uh, the momentum really has grown and it continues to grow. So uh, open, air, open Air started to support the, what was a pilot program for open access within Framework Program 7. Uh, this was only about a fifth of program areas um, and uh, those program areas, the projects within those program areas had to deposit all publications stemming from the research funding in uh, an open access repository. So uh, it was a mandate based on green open access, to use the jargon. But it did allow for um, article processing charges, payments from project funds. And the European Research Council um, followed broadly along as well, and we supported that. So this was how we uh, supported the European uh, commission until Horizon 2020, and Horizon 2020 saw a step change in the um, in the open access policies of the European Commission. So, what had been a pilot for open access to publications became a mandate with the same terms, still a green uh, uh, open access mandate deposit in the repository, but still uh, article processing charges during the project phase. But also, quite in innovatively, the European Commission because. Uh, very often the really good or, or the, the main results are published after a project is finished, quite naturally. Um, the main overview of a project, you can't have it while you're in the middle of the project and all the results aren't in. But by that time, all the money has been spent. And in fact, according to project rules, you're not allowed to spend money after the project has finished. So uh, we're running a pilot called the FP7 post-grant pilot. Funds are available if you have a... Um, a if you have a FP7 funded project that is finished within the last two years and you want to get funds to publish in open access, then uh, go to the Open Air website and find more information for this. Um, as well, we're now supporting the Open Data Pilot. The, uh, open, the open Data Pilot, very much like the FP7 open access pilot, um, started with about a fifth of program areas, um, test the waters, find out the workflows, and then, if it works, extend it. We've recently found out, within the last month or two, that it will be extended, and that from 2017, in fact, all projects funded under Horizon 2020 will now be open data by default. The uh, policies of the European Commission in this, it's a, it's a mandate, but they don't call it a mandate. Um, in fact, there are very easy opt-outs. You must give a, you just tick a box to say that you don't want to take part, and you tick a box to say why. And the, the, the whys are very standard for security, 
for um, that you might ex commercially exploit the results at the end, um, that you're dealing with sensitive data, or that you just don't have any data at all. <coughs> so, open air, how do we support these policies? We are, um, we have two sides. I, d I don't like to think of them as two sides because really they should be one side. And um, uh, the, uh, Leslie said that I, I studied a bit of philosophy. My PhD thesis used quite a lot of actor network theory, which is very much about don't separate the social and the technical. There is no separation ever. They're always connected. But anyway, for um, heuristic terms, let's say, we have two sides to our project. We have a human network. Um, and then we have the digital network, the, the technologies underneath it. I'll explain what both sides do in a second. Um, we're from uh, data centers, universities, libraries, and repositories. Within the project, we have 50 project partners, and we're in every European uh, Union country and beyond. We're in um, every country in Europe and beyond, almost. So the human infrastructure of Open Air is, uh, looks like this. Um, we're responsible for the strategic coordination here at Göttingen. Um, the, um, Norbert Lossau, who opened the conference this morning, is our scientific coordinator, and I'm the scientific manager. Um, so we are in charge of the overall strategic coordination of our network, and our network is a network of 33 national open access desks, so in every European country, in every uh, Euro European Union country and beyond. We're in Norway and Serbia and Turkey and so on. Um, we have uh, local people, local open access experts on the ground. And, then, and their um, tasks for us is to provide open access training and support at a local national level, to work on open access policy alignment, so to bring policy uh, the policies of the European Commission into harmony with the national policies and the institutional policies. We don't want conflict researchers to have, be faced with conflicting um, obligations. Uh, and they also they provide technical assistance to researchers and to research administrators. And then if this works from the European uh, level down to the national and the local level, we also then have outreach globally through the Coalition of Open Access Repositories, who are a, a project partner. And they lead um, our international alignment activities where we collaborate with similar networks in, um, on other continents, for example, La Referencia, in uh, Latin America and share in the US. So that, that's the human network. And then the technical network is um, uh, the question for the European Commission is we have a mandate which says that researchers have got to put these uh, publications in repositories. How do we know if they are doing so? And so our solution was that we we provide guidelines for metadata uh, harvesting. We provide guidelines for uh, metadata to the repositories. And we say, if you give us, if you put your metadata in this format, then we can harvest those, um, uh, the metadata from all these very diverse repositories across Europe, and we can bring it together, unify it, and provide um, a, a one-stop look on the research output of, in, in the, Initially, it was of the U European Commission and the, uh, the ERC, but uh, that mission has since broadened to other funders, uh, including the Wellcome Trust uh, and FCT in Portugal. So uh, the, the basis of the, of the technological side of Open Air is very much repositories, um, and uh, we also collect information from open access journals uh, and data repositories and uh, from Chris systems. We then are able to link this up, so link authors to data, to publications, to give a unified view of the research output of Europe. And this then can be used for discovery, to find things. Um, it can also be used for monitoring, for checking uh, open access, and so on, uh, levels of open access compliance, and so on. Okay. The result is a lot of numbers. Um, and then in Open Air 2020, we have more activities. Like I said, uh, we're very much tied to the uh, 
open access policies of the Euro Com European Commission. Our name is Open Air, and Open Air stands for Open Access Infrastructure for Research in Europe. So we started with open access and open access to publications, like the EC did. But the agenda and open access is nowhere near the the, uh, the implementation. The the um, the argument over if open access has been won, but how and when open access. Um, very much continues, and we do not forget that. But the fact is that the agenda has also broadened and evolved to, uh, to not only open access for publications, but also open access to data and open access um, uh, to scientific processes. The previous speaker talked of removing control. Um, I'm not sure if I'd see it in such terms of liberate. Um, I think, but it's definitely about bringing more transparency, more accountability, and more participation to science. So we have all these uh, different activities. Um, we're looking at legal issues in open data, literature, data integration, data citation, and so on. Um, but the one that I'm talking about today is our um, work in open peer review. And as I, as I said, the aim is to open up scientific processes and products at all levels to everyone. This is the aim of open science generally, the, um, t to the extent possible, I would say. Um, uh, in some cases, uh, the, the extent of open science will vary depending on domains and, and so on. But um, when I talk about open science, I'm talking about open access to publications, now data, but also to software and to educational resources, open educational resources, open methodologies, so open notebooks, the pre-registration of studies to enhance reproducibility. Uh, we're talking, I include also citizen science, and as part of the open methodology, open evaluation or open peer review. And why? Uh, because there are problems with traditional peer review. Traditional peer review, well, peer review itself is the gatekeeper at the moment to the literature. It's generally used to uh, assess the soundness of a work, but also um, is used particularly within uh, peer review within the higher Im uh, impact, the, one, uh, the gold standard journals. Uh, it's also used to... Um, to, uh, to certify the innovativeness of the research, quote unquote. I'm not sure that that's always true, but it's, it's um, used in, um, uh, as an argument for peer review. The um, problems with peer review that I would talk about would be the time it takes. Um, I, I had a paper that took 15 or 16 months. Um, just after my PhD, I submitted it for the review and it came back 16 months later asking for substantial contributions, by which time I had forgotten. <laughs> uh, my, I, I couldn't put myself back in the argument of that. Um, uh, when I had written it, I, it was during my, my PhD, I was just said, telling a friend earlier, I kind of felt like during my PhD I'd been uh, training for a marathon, an intellectual marathon, and in the time since I had been letting myself go intellectually and enjoying not thinking, so it was difficult to get back into that mind frame. Uh, so time, can we speed up the process, can we make it more accountable? If uh, peer review happens in, uh, uh, behind closed doors and we don't know who is saying what, does that mean that um, people can abuse their positions um, and so on? Could there be bias? Could reviewers, for example, um, have undeclared conflicts of interest? There's a problem. I'm amazed, frankly, that peer review works as it does because at the moment there's very little incentive other than the fact that it's considered to be part of the work of, a, of, a, of an academic. There's very little incentive to do it. Um, there's no credit and, um, and so on for it. And, the, and also the problem of, of wasted effort, the fact that these are, these are really important critiques and very often when once a paper is deemed to have passed peer review, it won't mean that all the flaws or the, um, uh, the proposed flaws identified 
in, in that review have been fully answered. It will just have met a certain threshold. But the review is still, um, uh, uh, as a secondary work to, uh, to um, give context and grounding to the, to the main article, this is work that's being done by academics on public money usually, and it's being wasted. It's, um, I'm sure that the publishers keep records of all these, but it, they will be in archives in many, uh, 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 many years from now, and only then would they become useful. They're useful now. So these are problems with open peer review, and I've talked for too long. I'm going to speed up. Um, open peer review. Uh, what is it um, is, a, is a good question. Many people have a narrow definition of open peer review, and they think either that it's a, a process that is not blind, so that the author and the reviewer are known to each other. Some people think that's open peer review. Some people think that the, um, that the peer review being published is open peer review. I think peer review is, open peer review is these and a lot of other things, I think is just an umbrella term, and it's best understood as innovative peer review or experiments with peer review. Um, generally, traditional peer review is anonymous. That is either single blind, so the author doesn't know the reviewers, or it's double blind and they're, unknown to, they're both unknown to, to, to each other. Uh, it's selective because the reviewers are selected by editors usually. Um, and it's opaque because neither the process nor the reviews are made in public. And of course, that uh, has problems for accountability. And openness for me can refer to when we change one of these conditions, one or more. So it can mean the absence of anonymity, so open identity. Uh, it can mean open participation where the reviewers, um, uh, who is a reviewer is more open uh, to participation. And it can also mean open access, uh, which means that the processes and the reviews are open. This is why we are looking into open peer review as part of open air, because open peer review is a major part of open science. So we used the open air infrastructure as a test bed or as a seed bed for experimentation. Um, during our workshop yesterday, it was pointed out that very often the for-profit publishers have a lot of money to do experimentation in these areas. Very often, um, non-profit uh, organizations have very little money to do that experimentation. Um, so I'm glad to say that we uh, made some funds available for experimentation. Um, the first that I want to talk about today is um, from Open Edit... It, I keep trying to say it in French, and I, my French accent's terrible, sorry. Open Edition, I'll just say it in English. Um, uh, which is uh, an open access publisher in France, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, and know uh, Pierre Monnier personally. So they did experiments with a francophone environmental uh, sciences journal. And they did two types of experiments. They experimented with open reviews, so the, uh, the reviews were carried out in public. They also experimented with open commentaries, where the plug-in um, hypothesis the annotation software was used so that anybody could um, annotate. So these, and for the open review, they just used the blog platform. So it wasn't trying to come up with reinvent the wheel technologically, but what they did do is hire a postdoc to do uh, the mediation. And so it was used as a social, um, treated as, so open peer review was treated as a, a social question rather than a technological one which is, of course, important. We always hear, um, uh, probably isn't always true, but we always hear that technology is the easy part and cultural change is hard. So um, what did they find? They found that the tone was overwhelmingly con cordial and constructive, but the authors and referees found that they had trouble finding their voice, finding the right tone and expressing the debate. This can be... Uh, uh, attributed to the um, what we might call re remediation of the process, the taking it, the process from behind closed doors. Um, if I hold a, a conversation over here in private, it would be difficult, different than if I s stood here in front of you all to have that conversation. Um, 
I would be a lot more self-conscious, for example. Uh, there was problems of, to skip to the third point, mediation in open commentary. Um, and uh, is, what was the film? Field of Dreams, where the quote was, if you build it, they will come. And it's not true with open peer review. Um, just because you make a platform available, it doesn't mean that it will be used. Um, so um, the open commentary required a lot of mediation from um, Julian, the, the, uh, the postdoc researcher, uh, to find commentators willing to engage. But this was in a society journal. This was in a journal which had a community already attached. It's not um, that there was no community or, um, of, of scholars. So this perhaps indicates um, uh, um, a difficulty for open peer review. Um, and finally, there was an ethical question, uh, which was the one author asked, received a, a constructive but critical review um, and immediately asked to be removed from the process. It, uh, this person did not want to uh, respond in public and, in fact, did not want a record of that criticism to remain online. And because the, um, this was quite a small-scale experiment and the, all the workflows had not been worked out, there, there had been no agree agreement prior to this. On, on what would happen. So, in fact, Julian took the review down, but then uh, we, we discussed later that in this case it was the right thing to do, but in our opinion, uh, that later on it would be best, and this was actually reflected in the findings of one of the breakout groups yesterday, that it would be best to, um, <coughs> to make it a policy that they would not be removed, but to make sure that researchers were aware of this up front. Of course, this then might have further complicated getting people to take part. Um, so this was one experiment with the uh, with Open Edition. The next, uh, we ran a tender call for experiments with Open Peer Review, um, ideally interacting with the Open, with the open Area Infrastructure. And, and one winner of the tender call was uh, uh, Joshua Nicholson from the Winnowa, um, along with uh, yeah, with uh, one Alperin from Simon Fraser University. And the winner um, had a few, a few tasks interrelated. So first of all, their main idea, the winner is a platform for what they call grey literature, which is non-traditional um, academic literature, blogs, uh, social media, um, and, and so on. And they are always looking for new types of knowledge that are going down the drain, as it were. Um, one of which they, uh, they found was what are called journal clubs. I, I don't know if anybody, if you're familiar with the, um, with the concept, but a journal club is um, a, a, group, a research group within a university who meet to discuss in a, um, what they consider to be important papers within their field. Um, and they come up with conflu conclusions, but this discussion generally just stays within that group. And Josh wanted to see if we could get that discussion out of the group and onto the internet. So uh, one of the ways that he sought to do this was through incentivizing post-publication. And they, in fact, offered small um, cash rewards. Okay. They offered small-scale small cash rewards um, of $250 or so. And it was thought that the students would, this would perhaps um, bring, uh, not for monetary reasons, but um, Maybe it would pay for pizza during the, um, uh, during the discussion or something. And that this might in some way incentivize. Um, it didn't. Uh, uh, it didn't at all. Um, and in fact, I'll skip forward. So what, what would incentivize scholars? What did they find? Number one, if it advances their career, um, so if tenure or review committees could see it, um, if their peers are doing it. So we know that, uh, well, in my opinion, academia is, is still just a playground, and we do very often what the bigger kids do or what our peers are doing. So if it was what everybody else was doing, a lot of people would do it. If somebody said that this was a very good review, um, people would want to um, publish it. Of course, if, if someone said it was a very bad review, probably very, very much fewer people would want to. Um, but we see that if people were paid cash, 
is in fact um, not, not a winning idea. Um, and then finally, the final experiment, and then I'll finish, uh, was with Open Scholar. They built an open peer review module for repositories, specifically for DSpace repositories. This is, um, is now been completed and made available, and is available on GitHub. If you have a DSpace repository, you can go to GitHub, um, uh, give this software to your repository manager or your tech team, and they can install a peer review module on top of your repository. And it makes them into functional evaluation platform. The, the module, it's um, quite an elaborate system. It includes published reviews, disclosed identities, and a reviewer reputation system. So as uh, reviewers review, they, the reviewers and their reviews can also be reviewed. People can say this is a good or a bad review. This is, and then if, over time, the reviewer themselves will come to have a review um, uh, a profile. People can say, this was reviewed by him. He has a f he's a four-star reviewer, um, him or her, sorry. So the, this is already in, in implementation, one uh, with the repository of the Spanish Institute of uh, Oceanography, and one with uh, Digital uh, CSIC, uh, the repository of the Spanish National Research Council. And these are some of the reactions that they've already had from within uh, the, the Spanish Research Council. Um, really very positive reactions so far. It was just these experiments just made live last month, so um, these are the, the very initial reactions. But um, people have been positive, have greeted this positively. Um, I think, uh, just to say, in terms of what Open Air wants to do in future, we want to bring um, standardization to the, uh, to the conversation. Um, but very much agreeing with what Leslie said during the panel earlier that, um, about the need for any standardization to be agreed um, in a participatory manner. And of course, that doesn't mean just Europe, doesn't mean uh, just open air. Um, so uh, like uh, we are a participatory network, and um, we would hope to work on a standardization of agreeing what open, what open peer review is, how we can um, evaluate if certain forms of open peer review are better or worse in certain situations than traditional peer review or others. And then finally, how we describe it for machines so that we can further uh, work to federate open peer review services and separate the peer review services from the publishing process. And with that, I'll say thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you, Tony.